and let them have dominion. The kingdom of God is within people. It's the advancement of the people that is advancing. Because of the faith must be backed by the assignment of this ministry is found from that past. You're onto a word encounter as Pastor David Ogwele ministers God's word to you with simplicity and power. God bless you. He created them to control the earth, to control the circumstances on earth, just like God controls the heavenlies. Quickly, let's turn our Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 2. Acts 2 from verse 16. Acts 2 from verse 16. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Can we all say upon all flesh? And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. Verse 18. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit. And they shall prophesy. Hallelujah. Did, are you included in this list that is made here tonight? He said, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. All flesh. And they shall prophesy. Hallelujah. He said, upon his main servants, his maid servants, he's going to pour out of his spirit. He said, young men shall dream dreams. I mean, shall see visions. And the old men shall dream dreams. Praise the Lord. Now, this is prayer and prophetic conference. Usually, most of what we do in this meeting is prophetic in nature. Now, a lot of us believers are very unfamiliar with the prophetic. In fact, for many of us, what we understand to be the prophetic is... My people, my people, thus said the Lord. Praise the Lord. So when somebody says, my people, my people, you know those things. Thus said the Lord, and it shall come to pass. Then we know that somebody is prophesying. Hallelujah. And then many of us have attributed the prophetic just to the office of the prophet. Hallelujah. But you can see here, the scripture is saying that in the last days, and that is where we are, we are already in the last days. The last days began with the outpouring of the Spirit on Pentecost. Hallelujah. I'll pour out of my Spirit upon all flesh. Now, this was Peter speaking. Peter was talking in response so what had happened? The Holy Ghost descended on the disciples who were on the, at the upper room praying. It came upon them and there were cloven tongues of fire visible on their heads. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost. They began to speak in tongues. Now when people saw that, many did not understand it. And so some said that maybe the disciples are drunk now in response peter said these men are not drunk this is just early morning they are not drunk but this is what was spoken by prophet joy saying in the last days says god i will pour out of my spirit so the outpouring of the Holy Ghost on Pente Pentecost was signifying also the beginning of the last days. The, that was signifying that the last days have come upon us. Now, one of the characteristics of those last days, as stated in that scripture, is that the anointing, the outpouring of the Spirit, will be upon all flesh, and all children of God, servants of God, everyone who 
has the spirit of God can prophesy. Hallelujah. Now, pastor mentioned in the sessions he had with us that this year the focus will be more on prophetic understanding. Most of what we've been doing is just declaration. So we come here, we pray, and then we speak. We declare. We speak over our life, over the year, and over a lot of other things like that, which is powerful. Now, but this year, Pastor, as he was giving direction, he was making us understand that before you prophesy, you need to have understanding. He said sometimes in the beads that we are prophesying or declaring, sometimes we find ourselves trying to build what God is destroying or sometimes have trying to destroy what God is doing. In other words, we run, we run contrary to what God is doing. Praise the Lord. The Bible says, Woe unto the man that uh, makes unrighteous decrees. So before prophesying, before declarations, there has to be understanding. There has to be revelation. You need to be able to know and understand the mind of God over an issue. I remember at a time here, I, 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 I taught on something about the prophetic. We have what is called foretelling. Foretelling deals with revealing the future. So, when you hear the prophet says, says, and it shall come to pass, thus said the Lord, it shall come to pass. In other words, that thing is yet to happen. But he's declaring it that it is going to happen. He's telling the future. That is just one dimension of the prophetic, telling of the future. There is also foretelling. So you have foretelling, F-O-R-E, that is telling the future. Then you have foretelling, F-O-R-T-H, foretelling. That one is not necessarily telling the future. It is taking the will of God or the word of God that you know and declaring it over a, a circumstance, over an issue, in order to change it or cause it to conform to God's will. Praise the Lord. We have prophetic intercession. We have prophetic action. Hallelujah. These are different aspects of the prophetic. Every believer, God's plan is for all of us to understand the prophetic and to operate in the prophetic. That does not necessarily mean that all of us are prophets in the sense like people who stand in the prophetic office. Praise the Lord. One of the marks of the prophetic is the ability to see. Revelation. In the olden days, they used to call the prophet a seer. In other words, he can see into the future. He has revelational gifts. Praise the Lord. He has revelational gifts. He can tap into the mind of God and be able to reveal it to men. That aspect, whether in, in this last day, whether you are standing in the office of a prophet or not, you can operate in it. That is why we all have the Holy Spirit. That is why there is the leading, the guidance of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit leads you, gives you revelation, gives you understanding over certain issues, that is an aspect of the prophetic in operation in your life. When God shows you things about your future, you don't need to prophesy it to anybody. But that is the prophetic giving you direction. Hallelujah. The power of the prophetic is with the church. 
God gave rulers, kings, political power. They exercise it. But to the church, what he gave is prophetic power. And prophetic power controls political power. Praise the Lord. The prophetic is one thing that has ability to control the natural world that we see. First of all, you need to understand that everything that happens here has its incidence from the, in the realm of the spirit. So when we, if you op operate blindly or just in the natural realm, you're going to be following things the way they are happening. And if you do that, you're likely to become victims of circumstances. The people who have power, who control and determine the things that happen on earth are people who have access into the realm of the spirit and have ability to control or manipulate things from that realm. Whether in the positive supernatural or negative supernatural. Hallelujah. We are born into the realm of the spirit. We have access into the realm of the spirit. Through the Holy Ghost, we have access. That is one advantage that is with the church. Praise the Lord. When we follow things the way they are happening in the natural, we follow it naturally, we become disadvantaged. What God expects is that we take a stand with him and find out what is going on in the realm of the spirit then apply it here we're going to see tremendous results we're going to have influence hallelujah hallelujah i said the prophetic controls even the political are you understanding the prophetic controls events that happen here on earth and with the prophetic it is with the prophetic that you can change a circumstance, something that is happening on earth. It can change overnight. You can change it. For instance, the, even the economy of a nation can be turned around overnight by the prophetic. The prophetic is so powerful, is so potent, that we need to understand it and we need to know how to operate in it. Hallelujah. But it begins with revelation. It begins with understanding. Now, uh, in one of the sessions, pastor said, taught something. He said, the three W's of the prophetic. He said, number one is worship. That is one of the keys into the prophetic. Worship. He said, the second one is warfare, prayer. Prayer. Then the third one is the word. The word of God. The word of God is already the word of prophecy. Is the prophetic word. Hallelujah. It has prophetic unction, prophetic power. This afternoon, Pastor Tony was talking about that. He said, you need to get into the scriptures and understand the, prof the, the word of God. You need to know it. Because sometimes what you are dealing with, you're not, you are not necessarily going to hear another thought said the Lord. Because that particular thought said the Lord is already written down in the scripture. All you need to know is to find it and understand it. Then you take it and apply it. Are you understanding So that is why we call this meeting prayer and prophetic. We do a lot of praying. 
We do a lot of praying. Because prayer is one of the keys. You know, when you pray, you pray. Usually when we start praying, we pray, we start in the flesh. And then you pray, you pray, you pray. Somewhere along the line, you cross the line between the flesh and the spirit. You step in. Once that happens, there are indications. One, your prayer changes. You sense the anointing. You sense the presence of God. The intensity of your prayer sometimes will even change. At that time, you, sometimes you begin to have insight, understanding coming to you. Praise the Lord. Once you have crossed that realm, that is where the real prayer starts. That is when what we call prophetic intercession begins. Are you understanding? Now, it is from that realm that you can make declarations or decrees and see things happen. Not the ones you do in the flesh. Praise the Lord. The same thing with worship. There's a point of worship. You step into the prophetic. At that point, at that point, the, the psalmist unction comes upon you. As you were worshiping, you were selecting the songs by yourselves. You get to that point. Sometimes even songs you did not plan to sing, you start singing. Sometimes new songs, new songs that you don't know start coming. Praise the Lord. At that point, you have crossed in. Praise the Lord. So most of our praying usually happens at this other side of the divide. And that is why it is not effective. Hallelujah. If you understand the prophetic, you can exercise dominion. Let me read the scripture for us to illustrate some of the things I have just uh, said here. Let's turn our Bibles to the book of... Uh, Second Kings chapter six. Second Kings chapter six. Let's go to verse twenty three. Go to 26. Okay. Go back a bit, maybe 24. And it came to pass after this that Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all his host and went up and besieged Samaria. Now watch. Verse 25. And there was a great famine in Samaria, and behold, they besieged it until an ass's head was sold for four score pieces of silver, that is 80 pieces of silver, and a fourth part of a cab of dove's dung for five pieces of silver. Verse 26. And as the king of Israel was passing upon the wall, there cried a woman to him, saying, Help, my Lord, O king. And he said, If the Lord do not help thee, when shall I help thee? Out of the barn floor or out of the wine press? Hallelujah. Now, there was a situation on ground here. There was famine. Artificial famine. Permit me to call it that way. Because it was circumstantial. That famine arose because of the besieging of the city by a foreign army. Now, I believe that probably maybe their farms were outside the gates. So because the army besieged the city, nobody could come out. They locked themselves inside. They ran out of, soon ran out of the supplies of provision that they had. And then famine set in. 
and the, the condition continued to worsen and worsen and worsen until it became so bad that women began to roast their children to eat. Now, look at it. This woman cried to God. He said, help me, O Lord. O, uh, o, uh, help my Lord, O King. And he said, if the Lord does not help you, how am I supposed to help you? That's what the king was saying. How am I supposed to help you? Is it from the barn or from the storehouse that is already empty? If God does not help you, I can't help you. Hallelujah. All right. So move on. Verse, the next verse. And the king said to her, what a lady, what is the problem? She answered. This woman, he turned to a lady beside, said to me, give thy son that we may eat him today. When a situation gets to the point where a woman who has spent nine months carrying a baby and has gone through labor, labor pangs, and delivered the baby can begin to think about roasting or cooking that baby to eat, that situation is bad. Are you understanding? Now, now, but, he said, this woman said to me, give that son that we may eat him today and then we will eat my son tomorrow. If I was that woman, I've told him, okay, since it's your idea, let's start with your son. And now she's complaining. He said, so we boiled my son and did eat him. And I said unto her the next day, give thy son that we may eat him. And she hid her son. She became smart. She wouldn't give up her own child. Now, this was the situation. Now, look at the response of the king when he heard this. Verse 30. Then he said, God do so, and more also to me, if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, shall stand on him this day. What was the problem of Elisha in all this? Where did Elisha come into all this? Was it Elijah that advised the woman to tell the other one to bring their child for them to eat? No. So why was the king angry with Elisha? Now the king knew that, now by the way, that was an economic situation that they were facing in that city. And there was no practical solution no practical economic sol economic solution to it. But the king knew that if there is one man, if there is one person who can turn things around, it is the prophet. And I believe the king was waiting on the prophet to do something. And nothing was happening. And things were getting worse. When he heard this one, he said it's too much. This is this is too much. And then he swore that may God do so more to him if the head of Elisha is still standing by the end of that day. So see what happened. I don't care the situation that is happening around you. I don't care how, how difficult, how unsolvable that situation looks like. In this place, in this meeting, the unction, the prophetic unction is going to come upon you with your mouth. With your own mouth, you are going to bore your way through that situation. A solution is going to come in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Verse 32. But Elisha sat in his house and the elders sat with him. The king sent a man from before him, but before the messenger came to him, he picked a signal. He said to the elder, See ye how this son of a murderer has sent men to take away my head? Hallelujah. So the prophetic unction started working now. Hallelujah. He said to take away my head. Look, when the messenger cometh, 
shut the door and hold him fast at the door. It's not the sound of his master's feet behind him. In other words, the king was also coming. Praise the Lord. So he says, shut the door. Keep them at bay. Hallelujah. Now, verse 33. And while he yet talked with them, behold, the messenger came down unto him and said, and he said, behold, this evil is of the Lord. What should I wait for the Lord any longer? He had been waiting on God. Hallelujah. That is one of the keys to the prophetic, waiting on God. You don't go prophesy. Just that you stand in the office of a prophet doesn't mean everything that comes up, you open your mouth and start declaring. You need to have an understanding. You need to have direction from above. Hallelujah. That is what Elisha had been waiting for. And God had not spoken yet and things were getting out of hand. Now, but under pressure, I don't know how it happened, but under pressure, something happened here. Say, so why should I wait for the Lord any, any longer? So he decided to act. But at the same time, verse 34, then Elisha said, hear ye the word of the Lord. Did he just talk? You know, in the previous verse, he said, why should I wait? No. That thing came upon him at that point when he opened his mouth God put a word in his mouth. Hallelujah. Say, hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus said the Lord, tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Samaria. Only the prophetic can attempt something like this. Famine has been run for a long period. And then this guy opens his mouth and said, by tomorrow, food is going to be so plenty that it will be so cheap, it will be sold so cheap in the gate of Samaria. Now, it sounded too good to be true. That, verse 2, they, 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 verse two then the Lord on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, if God opened the windows of heaven today, can these things happen? Praise the Lord. And Elijah said, Behold, thou shalt see it with your eyes, but thou shalt not eat it. He doubted the prophetic. I I'm trying to show you the type of power that is resident with the church. Praise the Lord. The prophetic is not with the word, it's with us. Hallelujah. It is with us. It is with us. A, a national problem, national economic problem, is about to be turned around overnight. Just overnight. That is what the prophetic can do. Hallelujah. We need to learn to operate in this. That is part of the teachings we're going to be getting in this meeting. We need to learn how to step into these realms and change things around us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody's circumstance is about to experience an overnight turnaround. Can I hear a bigger amen? Amen. When the prophetic word goes forth, one thing about the word of God is that when it goes, when it goes forth, it has capacity, inbuilt capacity to bring to pass what God has said. That's why in the book of, I think Isaiah chapter 50, verse 11 or 55 verse 11, I think it's 50 verse 11, God says, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. But it shall accomplish that which I please and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. 
So sometimes all you need to do is to find what God has said. What did God say over that circumstance? And even when you find it, don't just speak. Get into prayer. Get into the anointing. Get into the realm of the spirit. When the hand of God is upon you, take that word, declare it over that situation. The word of God, the written word of God is the revealed will of God. So when you have known that, you already have something with which to function. Are you understanding? It shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. It shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. When God's word has gone forth, nothing will stop it from coming to pass. It has power to connect to everything that is necessary to cause what God has said to happen. Now, over the period of Christmas, we are reading from the story of the birth of Jesus Christ, and we came across, you know, where the Bible said it was prophesied that Jesus will be born in Bethlehem of Judea. Now, but when Jesus' earthly parents met, they met in Nazareth. They got married in Nazareth. She got pregnant in Nazareth. The pregnancy came to time, she was still in Nazareth. The word of God that went for said she will be, he will be born in Bethlehem. Just about that time, an idea came into the heart of the king who was ruling at that time to take a census of all the people under his realm. And then, to do that, he decided to command everyone to go back to their village. Are you understanding? All that happened because God had spoken. And in what he said was that Jesus will be born in Bethlehem. The king didn't know what he was doing. He, he got a good idea. Something that is going to help his rule over the people. But God's word was about to be fulfilled. Hallelujah. Everything God has spoken over your life. Everything he has said over your life, over your family, your finances, your business, your career. I don't think care how many forces gang up. What I said the Lord is going to come to pass. In the name of Jesus Christ. He said, the word that goeth forth out of my mouth, it will return void. It must prosper wherever I send it. That's why when you find God's word, when you find the will of God from the word over a situation, you have the answer with you. Take that word, superimpose it on the situation. Declare it over that situation. You know, pastor usually say, he say the reason God's word is powerful because God speaks under the anointing. He said, when you take the word of God and speak it under the anointing, it carries the same power as if God spoke it. That is the essence. Hallelujah. So he said, thus said the Lord. He said, by this time tomorrow, food will be cheap. And the, the, you see, the, the, that guy, his carnal mind could not com comprehend it. He, he did a fast mental calculation about the processes that can bring this to pass. It didn't look like it's possible. So he voiced his doubts. And the prophet, still under the anointing, <laughs> spoke again. He said, you will see it, but you will not eat it. Hallelujah. Now, this time around, the word of God has gone forth. Even the word of God looks impossible, looked impossible to come to pass, to happen. And so, how did it come to pass? Look at, go back to that scripture. Second Kings chapter 6, chapter 7, from verse 2. Second Kings 7, verse 2. 
Okay, that is where we just read. Verse 3. And there were four leprous men at the entering of the gate. Remember I said, God's word, if, for, when it's moving, it can latch on anything. It can pick on anything. Hallelujah. And ride on it to produce the result. Now, this time around, look, four lepers. They were just sitting at the gate. I believe they, they were begging. They used to beg arms. But things were so tight now. When people are eating their children, you think they will give you money. Or they will dash you something at the gate. So a thought came into their minds. They said to one another, why sit we here until we die? If we say we're going to stay here in the city, famine is great in the city. And we shall die there. If we stay at the gate here still, we will also die. But there is a 50% chance that if we go into the camp of the enemy, they may decide to take us hostages. And in that case, they will feed us. Hallelujah. That was their thinking. That was their reasoning. But God's word was at work. Hallelujah. He said, now therefore come, let us fall onto the host of the Syrians. If they save us, we shall live. If they kill us, we will die. But at least there was a 50-50 chance. They kill us, we will die. But if they save us, we will live. That is the only place there was a possibility for not dying. So they took that option. They began to go. Hallelujah. Verse 5. They began to go. Verse 5. And they rose up in the twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. They were shocked. When they got there, there was no man. Nobody in the camp. And guess what? That particular evening, remember this is twilight, the day was about to break. After the prophet spoke the previous day, I don't know, maybe, maybe afternoon, but that particular evening, the Syrian army just received fresh supply of food. Some were just about to cook it. Some, their own was already on the fire, boiling. And then something started to happen. These four lepers took off to go to their camp. Now, the Bible says in verse 6, For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said to one another, Lo, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites, the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Four lepers. And, and you know, lepers, maybe they didn't even have complete feet, but they were walking. God caused them to hear the sound of a multitude, an army marching into their camp. Hallelujah. You know, it takes an action to trigger the fulfillment of prophecy. While the prophet spoke, God was waiting. Everything was waiting for someone to act. Nobody acted except this leprous man. They decided to act. I don't know if they heard the prophecy, but they decided to act. And by their action, the power of God began to move. Hallelujah. The power of God began to move. So four leprous men, but the, 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 the people were hearing the, the, the sound of multitudes, armies marching. So fear came upon them. They stood up and fled, taking nothing. Look at it. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their asses, even the camp as it were. This is what fear can do to somebody. You are running and the chief means to flee with, they left it behind. They are horses. What do you call that? Hallelujah. 
they were so afraid. They left their horses and their asses and even the camp as it was and fled for their life. And when these lepers came into the uttermost part of the camp, they went into one tent and found food. They ate and drank and carried tents, silver and gold and raiment and went and hid it. They came again, entered into another tent and carried tents also and went and hid. And then they said to one another, He said, we do not well. This day is a day of good tidings. And we are holding our peace. If we tarry the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. And they were right. Now, therefore, come that we may go and tell the king's household. Hallelujah. And that's what they did. They went and told the king. The king was suspicious. <laughs> Watch. So they called unto the porter of the city and they told them saying we came to the camp of the Syrians behold there was no man there neither voice of man but horses tied asses tied and tents as they were and he called the porters and they told it to the king's house within and what did the king say verse 12 the king arose in the night and said to his servant I will show you what the Syrians have done to us they know that we are hungry therefore they are gone out of the camp to hide themselves in the field, saying, when they come out of the city, we will catch them alive. He said it was a trap. Hallelujah. Verse 13. And one of his servants answered and said, let someone take, I pray thee, five of the horses that remain, which are left in the city. Behold, they are as the multitude of Israel that are in it. The horses that were remaining were looking like the people inside, emaciated. <laughs> Hallelujah. They are consumed. And let us send and see. Verse 14. And they took, therefore, two chariots horses. And the king sent after the host of the Syrians, saying, Go and see. Hallelujah. He said, go and see. And lo, all the way was full of garments and vessels which the Syrians had cast away in their haste. And the messengers returned and told the king. And the people went out and spoiled the tents of the Syrians. So a measure of fine flour was sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel according to the word of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Has God said anything to you before in this year? It is going to come to pass. I don't care the forces that have ganged up against you in that circumstance. It is going to come to pass. Hang on to that word. Hold on to that word. Don't give up. And if you are inspired, take the steps that need to be taken. You will see the power of God come through. You will see God come through on your behalf. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Rise up on your feet and let's pray. Have you been impacted by this message? Please share your experience with Pastor David Ogweli. Email address Dominion Image Media at yahoo.com or call 0179268790803 435 7959. 0803-590-9900 0805-315-3823